Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Outside the Box. I'm with a good friend, Kate Palmer, from Flourish Concierge PT. How would I do? You did great. Was that, that was it? That right. That was right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We're talking about pelvic floor PT. We're talking about orthopedic PT. So first, Kate, I want to ask a little bit about you. Um where are you from? Uh, we're in Johnson City right now. Yes. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your history. Yeah, I was born in Asheville, but uh, my family moved around a little bit growing up, and then we kind of settled here in Johnson City. Yeah. Went to Science Hill. Okay. Um, and then I went to UT for undergrad. Go Vols. I was thinking about what is Science Hilltoppers. 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 Okay. It's the hat. It's not the goat or the ram. It's a hat. <laughs> So it's the hill. For all you Johnson City natives out there, we've got a Johnson City local here. Uh, I went to Dallas Bennett. Oh, you know, it is what it is. We'll allow it. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I, we'll, we'll make this work. <laughs> we'll make this work and flourish is going to kind of bring us together yes. here. So tell me about your practice. Yes, um, we are a brand new uh, mobile and we do have some office physical therapy, provide mm. pelvic floor physical therapy and orthopedic physical therapy. Okay. What do you mean by mobile? Is that the concierge part of flourish? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this was a need that I saw when I was working uh, at my last job at a pelvic PT clinic. I had a lot of new moms who came in and they were having difficulty balancing their newborn babies as well as being in PT for themselves. Okay. So I mm. thought the the concept of being able to come to them at their home, they wouldn't have to bring their newborns out to an office. They can stay in a comfortable environment. Hopefully the baby is more calm or I can come to them while the baby is still asleep. <laughs> Nap time. So that's the idea behind the mobile part where I travel to patients bring all my equipment with me. We do the session in home and typically it's a more comfortable environment for everybody that way. I love that actually. Is, is that particular to, um, new parents, um, you know, uh, women with newborns, or is that also like for anybody? It's for anybody. Yeah. It's, interesting. it's, it's offered for anybody. I, I have a, a wonderful, sweet client who's in her nineties yeah. and she is not, um, super mobile. She doesn't like to drive. And so it works great for me to just come by and, and work with her at home. And it also helps because, you know, we're working with her environment and what's challenging for her, you know, what's her seat position like, you know, mm. how, Hi, does she have to stand up from a chair? Yeah. And we don't have to pretend like, what does that seat look like in a clinic? No, we're actually using the actual one that she has. Super or, you know, functional. Yeah, exactly. I exactly. Very that. personal. Now, mm -hmm. how did you, like, how'd you get involved in PT? What, what kind of brought on you wanting to go into physical therapy? Well, I'm a ballet dancer at heart. Okay. That was what I have done my entire life. Um, as soon as I could walk, my mom pushed me into ballet and I'm so grateful for it. And, um, as a ballet dancer or as any, uh, competitive athlete, you get injured a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I went through a lot of, um, ankle injuries trying to be on point. <laughs> and, uh, my uncle is a physical therapist and he treated me and I found the experience to be really fun. Mm. Surprisingly, even though I was injured, I was like, this is actually fun to go into the clinic and to, to try these different activities and to feel like, oh, I could, I could do more than I could do last time. And so it kind of sparked my interest about, you know, maybe I want to try this PT thing and try it for myself. I love that. That's mm -hmm. super cool. So you have a PT in the family. Yes. Uh, you're an athlete. So you kind of went at it from that perspective, injuries. Tell me a little bit about, you said on your uh, flyer here, it says pelvic and orthopedic physical therapy, you know, Pelvic floor therapy is not something we talk a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell me what that is to start with, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Pelvic floor therapy is just an extension of any other kind of physical therapy that you would have in an orthopedic setting. So if we think about you know, what PT is, we treat the musculoskeletal system. So muscles, joints, tendons, ligaments, and how we're able to move. When we're looking at the pelvic floor, we're focusing in on this group of muscles that we can't really see, can't really identify, but they also have a very crucial function. They support 
support our low back, our hips, our core. Uh, they support the organs that we have in our pelvic floor. So that would be our bladder, our bowels. Um, if we're female, we have a uterus. If not, then we don't have one there. But all of those organs are supported by this muscular system called the pelvic floor. Mm. And doing pelvic floor physical therapy is just taking a closer lens at those muscles and making sure that they're functioning appropriately with everything around it as well. So when I'm talking about pelvic PT, I'm not excluding anything. Sometimes I'll have a patient come in who's got some upper back pain or they have limitations in their shoulder, and that is translating down the spine and causing these problems in the pelvis. So we're not excluding anything when we do pelvic PT. We're actually just adding in this extra piece that sometimes gets missed when we do typical orthopedic physical therapy. So are you saying like a root cause of a pelvic injury could be in the shoulder or vice versa or both? Could be both. That's so the pelvic floor, if we think about our trunk, the pelvic floor is the base of our trunk. So when we're sitting, we don't have our weight going through our feet and through our lower legs. Okay. It stops. Most of our weight stops at our pelvis. And we think it stops at our sit bones, but our sit bones are really quite small compared to the amount of space we have down there. Most of our weight is being carried by our glute muscles and our pelvic floor muscles. So if we spend a lot of time in poor posture or we have, let's say we have a dysfunction or an injury somewhere up here that could be causing excess force down through our pelvis, maybe we have our weight shifted to the side, that puts undue stress on those muscles and can then create dysfunction. Would that cause, so you're saying when you're, when we're sitting down, the whole notion of sitting is the new smoking. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, is that, so that's actually putting more pressure on your pelvic floor than your, than your glutes. I would say it's, um, I'm not exactly sure the amount the percent load between the two, but those are the two main muscle groups that absorb mm. our force when we're sitting. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That is funny because we're so used to like our weight being transferred to our feet, to the ground. But when we sit, it does clearly stop. I'm like trying to be super aware of it right now since I'm, <laughs> since I'm sitting. Yeah. But that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Can you when you work on your glutes, are you also working on your pelvic floor? Absolutely. And a lot of the exercises that I, I prescribe to patients involve glute work, mm. whether it's stretching them, um, increasing mobility, because sometimes our, our glute muscles are not only weak, but they're also tight. Yeah. So we can have that together. And it, it doesn't always make sense that those two things go together, but they do a lot of times with the glutes. So when we're working and exercising, contracting our glute muscles, there's a lot of carryover and contraction that happens at the pelvic floor muscles too. Yeah, so, uh, so fascinating. One thing I want to ask you, Kate, is I have a feeling that more people might have pelvic floor issues that don't realize it. Absolutely. So I want to go over like what are some things to look out for um, for the people watching or listening, how would they even know they have a pelvic floor issue? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple main giveaways that would be obvious. So one would be pelvic pain. That could be pain anywhere in the lower abdomen down to the area between our legs. That can be pain when we have uh, bowel movement or if we're going to the bathroom. Okay. Or it could be pain at rest. That can happen too. That's That can be common, especially post-pregnancy. So someone going through postpartum or uh, going through the stages of menopause. That can be common as well. The other thing that's a dead giveaway is if we have any kind of leakage. So yeah. any urinary or fecal leakage, that's a, a strong indicator that we've got some pelvic floor dysfunction. Then some uncommon ideas or uncommon signs of pelvic floor dysfunction, low back pain. That's not one that we always associate with pelvic floor dysfunction, but two thirds of the time, if we've got low back pain, we've got some kind of pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm. And it's worthwhile to look at both together and see if one is the main driver or the main cause of the issue versus the other. So low back pain is huge. Um, we also see, you know, constipation. Mm. That's a sign of pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, Core weakness, that can be another sign too, because the pelvic floor is an extension of our core. It attaches to the same attachment site that a lot of our core muscles do. Mm. So when we contract our deep core muscles, we also contract our pelvic floor muscles. So when we have a dysfunction with one, it's very common to have a crossover and dysfunction with the other. 
this might be a tangent mm -hmm. um, and I might be throw you completely off, but is there like a way that we're not activating the pelvic floor? So like when I think of core, sometimes we, or our glutes, sometimes, you know, people have trouble actually like using them mm -hmm. is, you know, with the pelvic floor, is that sometimes something we don't know how to use or know how to build up? Cause yes. it, does that make any sense? Yes, at all? absolutely. Absolutely. What's interesting about the pelvic floor compared to the glutes, the glutes we kind of have to turn on and off. We have to be more thoughtful about it. Or we do an activity that automatically uses those muscles. Okay. The pelvic floor muscles are designed to be on all the time. They're designed to be contracting at a small amount 24-7 so that we're not constantly leaking on ourselves. That's what they're designed, even when we're sleeping. So, and in, in that is the main function. Is that right? That's one of the main functions. Okay. The other function is to hold everything in place. Because like I mentioned, while we're sitting here, we think that our sit bones are carrying a lot of our force, of, of our weight to keep things from falling out, but they're not. It's actually those muscles. Oh, mm -hmm. that, so like when you're talking about organs, like yeah. everything. Uh-huh. Yep. Huh. So prolapse, when we talk about prolapse, that happens when there's too much force on the pelvic floor and on those muscles. And then we have organs start to shift in the pelvis. Can you say prolapse? What is, what is that? Prolapse is when we have a any kind of organ, whether in females, the cervix or the uterus, in males, it could be the bladder or the rectum, females, bladder, rectum as well. If their anatomical position has shifted, so it could be for females, the most common shift that happens is the bladder, which sits right behind the pubic bone, shifts back and down and falls down towards the vaginal canal. So it moves from its position kind of up and forward to down and back a little bit. And then it, it basically takes the bladder, which should be this nice little happy oval shape and makes it like a kidney bean shape. So it can't contract and function correctly. So does that mean like you're you have no control over when you go to the bathroom? No, not necessarily. Or is it painful? Not usually. More often, it's you can have some leakage, some leakage, not full incontinence. That's pretty rare. Um, but the other thing would be it's difficult to actually empty your bladder because it's meant to be this oval shape, and now it's a kidney bean shape, and so it can't contract the same way that it could before. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Is that something... Uh, I would imagine this is something that is more likely to happen as you age? Or am I wrong? It can be, depending on, of course, it, it depends. Yeah. Every medical professional's favorite term, but um, <laughs> it depends on the stresses that the person goes through. So increased force through the abdomen and through the pelvic floor will increase your chance of having a prolapse. Not a guarantee, but it will increase your chance. So someone who has uh, chronic coughing or chronic constipation uh-huh. Unfortunately, Jeez. those two things increase your risk of prolapse. Doesn't mean you're guaranteed to have it and doesn't mean that it will be, you know, life debilitating, but it just, it increases your, your risk. The other thing is prolonged pushing during childbirth. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I'm sure that's something that a lot of mothers can relate to. Mm -hmm. It like, what do people do for that? Out of curiosity, is there like, uh, is that what you do an epidural for? Is that, is that a weird question? Do you mean like during the delivery? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the epidural is mostly for pain management okay. because you still have to try to, to push and contract. Yeah. Uh, but ideally for my pregnant moms out there, you want to try to be pushing with your abdomen and not from your pelvic floor during, during delivery. Your pelvic floor should just relax and open in an ideal world. Um, but prolapse is honestly more likely to happen with those kind of chronic lifelong conditions of constipation where you're straining frequently and and then coughing. That's so wild. COPD and asthma, unfortunately, the, the pressure from coughing forces downward pressure on the diaphragm, which then impacts your pelvic floor. It, it, it increases the, the force load on those muscles exponentially. That's why I bet most people don't even realize it's happening. Mm -hmm. When I'm coughing a lot, when it, you know, if I've had bronchitis in the past, I feel it in my abs, you mm -hmm. know, like, oh my gosh, I feel like I just did a 30 minute ab workout. But I, I had... I wasn't even paying attention to what it could do to the pelvic floor. Yeah. Just a tip. Try to do a Kegel before you cough. 
<laughs> okay, explain <laughs> if you can. Explain a Kegel because uh, I know it's something everyone's heard of. Uh-huh. Uh, let's just this is outside the box. Let's go outside the box. Yeah. What, what is a Kegel? So a Kegel is a contraction of your pelvic floor muscles. Okay. So these are all the muscles from your pubic bone to your tailbone. Okay. Everything under there, they all contract at the same time. You can't do one at a time. They're all together. When we think about doing a Kegel, we're thinking about closing those muscles together and then lifting up towards the belly button. Huh. So it's like a two part. We're trying to do it all at the same time. But if you're thinking about what am I trying to get those muscles to do? Close and lift. That's Close what a Kegel and, should do. And I feel like, is that the answer to a lot of some of these issues? If you have a pelvic floor problem, Typically, no. (laughs) Typically, no. That's what's so surprising. Guys, I thought I was going to have the answer for you. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's not a quick fix. Um, So I I see patients all the time who have come in and they're like, I've been practicing my 100 Kegels. Or I had somebody come in and tell me that they were doing 1,000 Kegels a day. And I was like, your poor pelvic floor. That's way too many Kegels. Um, (laughs) Most of the time... So like I mentioned, the pelvic floor is on, it's working all the time. Yeah. Most of the time, our pelvic floor needs a chance to relax. It needs a break. Mm. It's the the parent who's been doing all the work and needs the other parent to step up and do their job. <laughs> so it's it's the, the muscles of the pelvic floor typically need to be relaxed and lengthened. And it's the adjacent muscles of the core, the hips, and the low back that are not activating correctly and need more strength to take the load off the pelvic floor. Okay. So uh-huh. in that scenario, a Kegel is like overkill. Yes. Way overkill. Mm-hmm. And you're saying that, or what I'm hearing mm-hmm. is that your pelvic floor is working all the time, mm-hmm. essentially. Mm-hmm. So part of the answer is to strengthen other parts so that there's not so much pressure on the pelvic floor. Exactly. That's exactly right. Okay. Mm-hmm. And how, like, how, how do you do this within your PT? Like, what is that like? Is that like certain exercises? Um, is it certain like, uh, pressure points? Mm-hmm. You know how you can sometimes activate things with, oh, yeah. with, uh, you know, pressure. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, usually I, I try to do a little bit of both the strengthening and the relaxing at the same time. So if I have a patient who's got, let's say like leakage or prolapse, and she's got a really tight pelvic floor, those muscles are, are working super hard to hold everything in place. And then the back and the core muscles are not strong enough. What we'll focus on is trying to do some, what we call down training. So down regulating and relaxing the muscles of the pelvic floor. This can be by doing diaphragmatic breathing. That's Mm -hmm. one of my favorites. Some uh, diaphragmatic uh, belly breathing. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. So when we inhale, trying to breathe more into the abdomen and the rib cage and not so much from the upper chest. Okay. Yeah. That helps to relax the pelvic floor really well. I always will recommend a handful of um, gentle yoga poses and trying to do some restorative yoga can be really helpful. Um, And then sometimes we'll do some hands-on work to the pelvic floor as well, Mm. depending on what the patients are comfortable with. So whether that's like external massage to the glutes or to the iliopsoas, our hip flexor muscle, that can be really helpful. And sometimes we'll work directly on the pelvic floor muscles themselves. So similar to like a gynecological exam, but no speculum, um, just kind of looking at the muscles themselves and trying to relax them and stretch them. It's like trigger point release, yep. but to the pelvic floor. Super interesting. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the psoas and it's something I've looked into recently. Is that something that I feel like holds a lot of tension or, mm-hmm. or is like a lot of, is get sore easy or tight easily? Mm-hmm. Does that have anything to do with your pelvic floor? Well, if we think about where it's located, so the psoas goes from our low back. Well, the whole, the iliacus and the psoas together that make up the iliopsoas, it's, it's two muscles technically. Um, so we're, I'm just going to mention the iliopsoas. It goes from our lumbar spine, mm. so the back of us, and then down through the front of the pelvis and the pelvic canal to the inside of our femur. So it runs right adjacent to all of our pelvic floor muscles. Interesting. Uh Okay. Okay. And it's very close to our core muscles too. What I see a lot of times um, when I 
hop on the social media is that there's a lot of core exercises that focus more on the iliopsoas than they do the core itself. So we can overuse our iliopsoas, overuse our hip flexors. So then they just become kind of tighter and tighter and tighter. And we get into this kind of posture. Um, or if we stay in this posture, that can tighten our iliopsoas as well. And any kind of abnormal posture like that, if we think about this position, puts more pressure on our pelvic floor. It puts more pressure on our organs. Mm. So it makes those pelvic floor muscles have to work harder. So anything that we can do to try to offload the pelvic floor can be really helpful. Is it safe to say that your pelvic floor is as important as your core? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Explain that because I, based on everything I'm hearing from you, I'm like, geez, this is really important. <laughs> I know. And that's why I'm so like excited it, it to like, get to share. Yeah. It holds all your organs. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many bad things that can happen and it's working overtime all the time. We're not thinking about it. You know, uh, you know, we're all, you know, I'm sure we've all had times where we've been constipated or, mm -hmm. you know, like it's just so every day. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about, give your case as to why the pelvic floor is more important than the, than the core or as important. I'm going to say it's as important. Okay. So the core, when I think when we think about the core, we're thinking that's what gives us good posture. That's what's helping to support our back and keep our back from hurting in the long run, which is absolutely true. Our core does keep us in, when we think about engaging our core, we're thinking about supporting our spine. When our spine's in a good position, we likely have good posture. However, the core doesn't stop at the pubic bone. It continues down and kind of becomes the sling of the pelvic floor. So the core... The sling is in like it holds the pelvic floor? They're all, they're kind of all connected. Okay. So even though they are labeled as separate muscles and they do contract through different nerve innervations, I'm getting real specific now, but... Um, our core muscles, so kind of the front part of the body that start really at the bottom of the rib cage and then go down to the pubic bone, our pelvic floor muscles meet at the opposite side of the pubic bone and wrap around to the tailbone and meet the glutes. So when we contract, I think I mentioned this before, when we contract our deep core muscles and we're engaging and pulling those muscles inwards, our pelvic floor is also contracting and lifting inwards together. So there's a lot of co-contraction that happens together. Mm. When we have too tight of a core or we're overworking our core, we are pushing more pressure downwards on the pelvic floor as well. Mm. So we can overdo it. We can't yeah. overdo like, um, you know, doing too many sit-ups, we can overdo the other side and have some leakage or have some risk of prolapse if we're putting too much pressure. Because when we do that crunching motion, if we think about what's happening to our abdominal pressure, it's increasing every time we do that motion. So it's important to build a strong core, but we want to have a strong and functional core. And that goes hand in hand with the pelvic floor. Mm. You know, we're not going to the gym to work out our pelvic floor to go to the beach and show it off. <laughs> we're, we're working our, we want to work our core and we want to work our pelvic floor so that it's functionally right. as strong as it can be. Right. And we can do everything that we want to be able to do. When I think of the pelvic floor during this whole conversation, I'm thinking just pure function, mm -hmm. you know, that and posture, actually let's get to posture. Uh -huh. How, how can you use your pelvic floor to get better posture? Is that possible? I think it is possible. I think it has to do more with, um, understanding our hip alignment and hip position. Yep. So then it goes hand in hand with the glutes and the iliopsoas. Those yeah. guys become very important. Um, I think it's helpful to think of the pelvic floor as a piece of the puzzle and not not isolate it necessarily and okay. say, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a part of our pelvis. So when we think about the pelvis, we just want to automatically include the pelvic floor. So if we're thinking of shifting our pelvis forward and backwards, doing pelvic tilts or something um, to adjust our posture, we are activating our pelvic floor to be able to do that. But it's more of um, we want to we want to be inclusive and think of not just how is my low back, how is my hip, how is my glute, but how is everything in my pelvis connecting in this moment. Um, a huge part of my practice is teaching mind body awareness, if you can teach that. <laughs> but I mean, if, you know, if I if I tell someone go do a bicep curl, 
I can watch them do that perfectly and say, yes, that was correct, or no, we need to modify. We can't do that with the pelvic floor. We ca- mm. I can't, you know, you can't look and have x ray vision and right. say, this is what's going on. So it's so much about being aware of your own body and your own sensation and sensing, okay, I can feel I have a lot of tension. I can feel gripping in my glutes. That's usually easier to identify is gripping my, I can feel my glutes squeezing tight or I can feel my core squeezing tight. And that's a good indicator that we're also squeezing our pelvic floor and a good chance for us to check in with that part of our bodies to try to relax. That tends to help a lot. And relaxing through the diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Any other tips for that? Because it still seems to me that the big thing is learning to relax it as much as activate it. I know the Mm -hmm. Kegel part would be the activation. Mm -hmm. The belly breathing would be kind of the relax relaxation. The, the mind body awareness is just kind of just understanding when you're uh, tensing up and when you're not Mm -hmm. any other tips for that. That's fascinating. It is. Um, I will give, uh, meditation homework sometimes for, for clients. Uh, I have a couple guided meditations that I like that just kind of talk you through different muscle groups of the body. There's a series called progressive muscle relaxation where there's a speaker who will say, okay, you know, squeeze your fist five times as hard as you can and then relax. Oh yeah. 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 And there's a version for the pelvic floor. Super interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think, I I do think it can be helpful to have someone like an expert who knows, you know, what your symptoms might align to or who can examine and say, Hey, this is what I'm seeing that goes with your symptoms. But the more mind body awareness that we have, the more understanding of our own anatomy that we have, I think the better off we are. Understanding our own anatomy is like a, a really cool idea. Like mm-hmm. I, I think everybody should at least try. Oh yeah. Try to understand through, you know, talking with experts like yourself, like just in listening to your own body as well. Mm-hmm. One thing I, you mentioned before we hit record is the use of hormones mm-hmm. with pelvic floor. Uh huh. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about that. It, it, how does that work? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So a common symptom that patients will come in and say is, um, I've got some leakage. I'm in that premenopausal stage. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm, I'm noticing some leakage and some changes. Mm. And then when we do a pelvic exam, I notice what I w- what we call in the medical field, vaginal atrophy. This is a condition that happens when the tissues of the pelvic floor lose some of their water content. Okay. This can this happens typically throughout the aging process, more so when we go through menopause and we lose estrogen mm. in that area. Um, it can also happen if we have a hysterectomy because we lose the the, the organs that create estrogen mm. right in the pelvis. So I have I've had some patients who are young uh, who have had vaginal atrophy because they've had a hysterectomy kind of early. But anyways, uh, so vaginal atrophy is when we lose that estrogen, so we lose water content in the tissues. Mm. My terrible analogy is that it's like having a raw steak that's full of water and it's really kind of plump and juicy and you can squish it and you can kind of press into it and it kind of squishes back Got it. versus a well done steak. There's not a give, there's not a lot of squish to it. Interesting. Um, and there's more friction and it's more difficult to, it's not as pliable. Okay. So that's uh, my terrible analogy for what <laughs> happens with vaginal atrophy. <laughs> when we think about what causes urinary incontinence, there's, there's several causes, but in the the phases of aging, going through menopause, when we lose the water content, our tissues shrink and get smaller. So around the opening of the urethra, we would have like big plump tissue that kind of closes off and adds some pressure to close off the urethra so we don't have leakage. And then that tissue shrinks and we don't have that full complete closure. Okay. So that's where topical estrogen comes into play. Um, If I see that a patient has vaginal atrophy or it's been noted in their medical history, that's something that I will ask is, are are you using topical estrogen? Is that something that you've tried or been interested in? Because I notice it goes hand in hand with a patient's improvement, especially for urinary incontinence. That is so interesting to Mm -hmm. me. It's it's interesting how all of this kind of interacts with each other. It's Mm -hmm. all kind of connected. Um, real quick before we let you go here, can, can we talk a little bit more about constipation? Just sure. Because yeah. It's, it's like I said earlier, something we all can relate to. Um, talk to us a little bit about what happens, how, how people become constipated, 
initially I think, okay, they need a probiotic and they need fiber, Mm -hmm. you know, but there's other stuff going on as well. Can you just walk us through that? Yeah. Well, there's the whole, you know, gut motility piece and the way that our microbiome of our gut works. And Mm. I'm not going to get into that because that's not my specialty. My specialty is the function of the muscles. But if we think about when stool reaches the rectum, it creates a lot of pressure in the rectum and we get the sensation of, okay, I have a full rectum. I need to go have a bowel movement. There are two sets of muscles at the opening of the rectum that are supposed to relax Mm. when we have a bowel movement. If we have stool that is really hard and difficult to pass, those muscles have a hard time opening and relaxing. So we end up straining and that is uh, closing off our epiglottis, doing that kind of <laughs> kind of sound. And we put all this pressure through the diaphragm and all that pressure I was talking about we don't want through the pelvic floor in order to pass a bowel movement. So to manage constipation, What we always want to do is make sure that there's enough water, we're taking in enough water, there's enough fiber that our body can process because sometimes too much fiber too soon can backfire Mm. and our body is not used to handling or processing as much soluble fiber as we think. So it can take a little bit of time to increase the fiber um, to get to a comfortable place. So we want the stool to be a good, um, you know, soft, not too hard, not too runny. And then when it comes to the muscle function, we want to be able to relax the muscles, not that we want to try to grip and squeeze the muscles because that's closing off the rectum. Mm. So make sure that you want to take enough time when you're on the bathroom, you're not trying to rush, try some deep breathing. Um, A tool that I love is called a squatty potty. (laughs) It's a little stool you put your feet on and then My tip is always to lean elbows on your knees. That puts your hips in a better position to have a bowel movement without straining. And that puts you in position to relax. Yes. Because it feels like the the natural, especially if you have been constipated, the urge is to push more. Uh Uh-huh. And that actually like has the opposite effect of what you're wanting to happen? Yes. Kind of? Yes. So... There's there's kind of the twofold approach. We want to try as best we can so that when the stool reaches the rectum that it's not hard. So we want to make sure we're having enough water and that fiber is helping to do its job mm. so that the stool is easier to pass. But then on the other side, we don't want to get in the habit of straining because we train those muscles that that's how they're supposed to function yep. when they're not supposed to. Ideally, so this is something we haven't really talked about, but ideally when you're in this position, you want to try to contract your abs And um, I like to do it while I exhale. So kind of like a (sighs) contracting your abs. Contracting in? So pulling your belly button in? pulling your abs in and imagine lengthening your pelvic floor at the same time. Interesting. And that relaxes the muscle. Yes. That's how we're supposed to have a bowel movement. That's Mm -hmm. interesting. You know, who 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 taught us that? (laughs) Nobody taught us that. So that's what I'm here for, though. (laughs) Okay. This has been phenomenal. Is there any way that I could convince you to come back on the show and we do like a part two? Like this is, there's so many different avenues we could go Mm -hmm. down. Super fascinating. Can we go like in front of everybody? Yeah, sure. You're committing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. right. Dobbins Bennett fan and all. (laughs) I'll allow it. I'll overlook it. Yeah. So Kate, tell everybody where can they find you? Where is Flourish Concierge PT online? How do we get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. So just look for Mm -hmm. flourishconciergept.com. My name's Kate Palmer, doctor of physical therapy. My business phone number is 423-845-5845. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram as well. If you just type in Flourish Concierge PT. I should, I should pop up there. You should see me on there. Um, you can always email me or you can um, call that number. And if you have any questions, feel free to call. I'll be happy to chat with anybody about any issues that they have and see if they're a good fit for a pelvic PT. That's amazing. Kate, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. That's a show. There we go. Thank you, guys. As always, thank you all for hanging out with us on Outside the Box. Kate Palmer here. Check her out online or give her a call. Kate, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Don't go away.